Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. So good to see you in the house of the Lord. Let's stand together and invite God's presence in this place. Are you thankful to be here? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's lift our hearts and our hands to heaven. Jesus, we love you. We're here to magnify you and lift up your lovely name, Lord, the name that is above every name in heaven and earth. And God, we bow before you, Lord, in reverence. We give you glory. We give you praise. Let us enter into your presence through worship and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. We want to give you, Lord, the highest praise today. Thank you, God, for meeting with us. Hallelujah. Let's remain standing as the worship team comes. done so much for me I cannot tell it all I cannot tell it all Can you don't have songbooks, do you? No. 
Okay. <laughs> you know most of the words, all right. Um, we'll give a reward to the first person to find that. And that's Pastor 56, number 56. That's right. We took away your songbooks. Won't you be glad this is all over? I don't mean life. I mean COVID. <laughs> I am looking forward to heaven. I just don't want to go today. <laughs> but if the Lord should call me, I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go to heaven? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let's sing this old number here. There's a land that is better than And by faith. And by faith.
Oh 
I said, well, why would you tell us something like that on a beautiful Sunday morning? Because there's a beautiful heaven waiting for you if you're prepared. But don't, don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that you're going to get in because you've been a good person, lived a good life. You've got to be saved. You've got to be born again to go. That heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And I love you today. I love your soul. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. And you need to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And before this day is out, that can be a reality for you. I've, I've taken that step. I was 10 years old. And I've been living for God for almost 48 years. So now you know my age. I don't regret one day living for the Lord. Not one moment. Not one second living for God. He's sweet, I know. Every joy in life, he has only enhanced it by his presence. And every sorrow I've had to go through, it's been less a sorrow because he's been there with me. But oh, yes, we've had our tears. But through it all, he's been there. Hallelujah. I wouldn't trade him today for silver and gold. I've had family members say to me, "Oh, say about me, you know, it's a shame that Bill never did anything with his music. By that, I guess that meant maybe my light wasn't up, my name wasn't up in light somewhere. That I wasn't on the stage singing before thousands of people. But when I look at the lives of those poor people that do that, I know that most of them are on drugs. They die of suicide or overdoses. They've been married umpteen times. They're some of the saddest people in this world. I've got a mansion waiting for me on the other side. It's streets of gold. Walls of jasper, gates of pearl. I'll take my reward because I'd rather have Jesus. Amen. We can sing it in unison. I'd rather have Jesus.
I think we could just continue on singing. Praise the Lord. I feel God so close in this service today. So close. And I just appreciate his presence. Thank you, ladies. Amen. Those polka dots really help you sing well today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Wednesday night is uh, July 1st, but see, there'll be no fireworks, no celebrations anywhere with the, uh, the way things are right now. How many of you would like to have church on Wednesday night? Amen. All right. Now we need a few more. Come on now. Come on now. I drive all the way I do. You can put both hands up. It look like double the crowd. Okay. Let's have service on Wednesday night at 7. Amen. And Sister Elsie would like to meet with the Sunday school teachers at 6 o'clock. And uh, uh, it's for a meeting regarding uh, the uh, opening of Sunday school next Sunday. Wouldn't that be great? So we've got to do some heavy sanitation and make some, uh, uh, do a little training of our teachers and that. So um, Sunday or Wednesday night, uh, 6 o'clock, uh, Sunday school meeting and 7 o'clock Bible study. And next Sunday, next Sunday morning, service at 11. Uh, actually, we'll start at 1030. Let's start service at 10. 30, so spread that far and wide, 10.30, with, uh, where we're starting our Sunday school. So we'll go back to 10.30. And then um, uh, Sunday night, at um, we will start uh, prayer at 5.30. We'll just pray in the sanctuary, and then we'll have our service at 6. And uh, we will be honoring our graduates. After service, we'll be having cake and ice cream. And so um, those that have graduated, we have about five that have been associated with our, our church here. And so... Uh, we're looking forward to that. We have some prayer requests. As I mentioned, Alice Le Williams, my mom, Alice Levitt. Uh, let's pray that for the end of this COVID. There have been major, some major outbreaks again in the States. Let's pray that that will end government leaders. Let's pray for righteous leadership. Amen. Amen. Righteous leadership. Let's pray for the salvation of our, of our leaders. Let's remember uh, Isabel French in prayer. And um, Joanne had a friend, a uh, friend's daughter that... Uh, Okay. What was the name? Manika. Manika. Okay. I don't know if I got that right or not, but let's remember this young lady just graduated and, and does need the Lord to touch her. And um, Cornerstone Youth and Sunday School Seniors shut in. Atlantic District Ministry, St. George Community. Uh, I think that's everybody. And then our family as well. And if you are part of the um, prayer shawl ministry, we're not passing the prayer shawl out, but we do need you to... Uh, Check the schedule. I think that schedule's at the back. Or okay, who who will be on this week for prayer? Matt, Sister Madeline is on for prayer this week for Pastor, and that's a prayer for provision, protection, and uh, empowerment, and uh, thirty minutes a day for Pastor and a family in the church. Did you have another? Oh dear. All right. Let's remember her in prayer. Uh, any other requests that we have today? Uh, yes, Sister Joy. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, yes, Brother McCarty has had some severe back trouble. Pastors and ripples, let's lift them up as well. Anybody else today? Could you continue to remember Corey and Sam? Corey and Sam, yes. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Sister Mary. Mother. Yes, let's remember Ronnie's mom in prayer. How many of them say loved ones and... And special unspoken requests. Are there any other needs we have today? Um, any other needs? Yes, Ronnie? Brother Rudy. Yes, let's remember Rudy in prayer. Okay, I don't think I've missed anybody. Oh, yes, uh, Rudy? Ruby? All right, let's remember Tommy in prayer. Let's stand together. Sister Violet, take us to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves and come before your throne, O oh Lord God. We are so thankful, Lord, that we have such a gracious and wonderful God, O oh Lord Jesus, that hears our every need and our every prayer. I pray, Lord God, for the needs, O oh Lord God, that were spoken here this morning, Lord Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord God, that your hand will be upon our pastor and his family, O oh Lord God. You provide and protect them, O oh Lord God, empower them, O oh Lord Jesus. Move upon them, O oh Lord God. We ask your hand to be upon Alex, Lord, and bring him in unto your safety, Lord, we pray. We ask, O oh Lord God, for Rudy, Lord Jesus, that you move upon his life, O oh Lord God. You not only heal him, O oh Lord God, but you save his soul, O oh Lord, I pray. Pray, Lord God, that your hand will move upon our lost loved ones, O oh Lord God, for Sister B, O oh Lord God, a faithful Lord Jesus. She's been faithful unto thee, O oh Lord God. 
I pray, Lord God, that you would ease her pain, oh Lord God, you'd minister, Lord, upon her and strengthen her, Lord Jesus. I pray, oh Lord God, that your hand would move upon every unsaved loved one, every hand that was lifted, oh Lord Jesus. I pray that you would be with us, Lord, the remainder of this day, that you would bind us together in your love, oh Lord Jesus, with cords that cannot be broken, oh Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, draw us, oh Lord God, into your sanctuary, Lord, draw us into your place, oh Lord God. Let us have, oh Lord God, empowerment and prayer in thee, oh Lord Jesus. I pray, oh Lord God, that you would give your people a hunger of prayer, oh Lord God. Yes. I ask these things, oh Lord God, to be with us for the remainder of this day. Anoint our pastor this morning as he brings forth your word, oh Lord God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. Have a lengthy passage to read. My message today is entitled, The Power of Sacrifice. The Power of Sacrifice. And this is probably going to be part of the series because I've got so many notes. I didn't really know where to go with this because it, there's just so much. But we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 12. And while you're turning there in your Bibles, let me just say that I appreciate everyone coming out to the house of the Lord today. We've got several folks that are not here, probably 20, 25 or more, maybe, maybe even 30 that are not here. That we just pray that the Lord will take care of whatever situations are there in their lives and minister to them and uh, help them to be able to get, we've got several children that are not out. And then some people have in their family, uh, somebody with underlying, underlying conditions, <clears throat> medical conditions that they're just being extra cautious during this time. But I'm believing that the Lord is gonna bless us and that within, hopefully within a couple of weeks, all the cases will be down to zero in New Brunswick and that the Lord will just open this up that we can be able to be back to uh, at least the new normal, amen? amen? Praise the Lord. I encourage you to be in prayer every day, seeking the Lord. Uh, stay close to God. It's so important that we be, Amen. that he be number one in our lives. Thank you, Amen. And I believe you need to start your day off with prayer. You need to start your day off with the word of God. And uh, don't leave it to the last of the day. Young people, spend time with the Lord first thing so that God can influence your day. Amen. Amen. And parents, encourage your, encourage, encourage, encourage. Positively encourage. And uh, let's, Let's try to do that every day in our homes. All right. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, the new year for Israel is not January 1st. That's not the new year. But it's in March and April. And it varies. It depends upon when Easter is. Because, you know, they have a 30, their months were reckoned by 30 day intervals, rather hours are rather 31 and 28 or 29 with February. So our year is a little bit different from theirs. So therefore, and because of the position of the moon and everything, that's why Easter sometimes can be in April and sometimes it can be in, in March as well. It moves around. But that was the new year for Israel because they were slaves. Now we're living in a day when there have been a lot of riots, particularly in the states, black lives matter. And all lives really matter to the Lord. Amen? We're all equal to the Lord. But right now there is a special emphasis on uh, minorities that have been neglected and abused and hurt in the past. And uh, that's, that's a real big thing in the states. Well, Israel could relate to this because Israel had been for many, many decades they were slaves to the Egyptians. And the Egyptian empire was a powerful, powerful empire. And what started out as 70 people, Jacob's family, Jacob's name became Israel, of course. He's the father of the Israeli nation. He and his family, there was about 70 of them, went down into Egypt. Joseph had been betrayed by his brothers and sold as a slave. And Potiphar, a chief man in Egypt, took him in as a slave. And um, uh, so what happened was eventually uh, a terrible famine came upon the world. And Pharaoh had had a dream. And in that dream, uh, God spoke to him through Joseph. Joseph gave the interpretation that there were going to be seven uh, years of plenty. And uh, there would be bumper crops of grain and fruit and everything else. And then it would be followed by seven years of famine. And this famine hit the then known world. And what happened was because Joseph provided the answer to Pharaoh, he was exalted from slavery into a position of power. And he became second in line to Pharaoh. 
became very, very powerful in Egypt. And so as the famine progressed in the land of Canaan, which bordered with Egypt, that's where Joseph was from. His family ran out of rain, and so his dad said, while you're sitting there looking at each other, why don't you go on down to Egypt? I've heard that they have grain. And they had grain because of the blessing that Joseph was upon Egypt. Joseph, well, how many know that we are to be a blessing wherever we are? Amen. Even if we've been mistreated, and he could have said, look, I, I, look, you can all just go to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> he could have said that to Egypt, but instead he had a burden for those people. He cared for them. And because of that, God raised him up and exalted him as a leader. You know, we need to deal with bitter things that happen to us in a positive way. Amen? Some, sometimes life can give you a bitter pill, but don't swallow it. Don't, don't become bitter. Become better. That's what Joseph did. So God exalted him because of his tremendous spirit and his attitude. And so meanwhile, the brothers and and. And Jacob, the father, assumed that Joseph was probably long dead. And Joseph's brothers are sent down into Egypt. They're sent down into Egypt, and there they are, and they're bowing before Joseph. And they don't recognize him because he doesn't look like an Israelite. He doesn't have the beard anymore. He's clean-shaven like the Egyptians, and he's wearing the Egyptian dress, and He's got, you know, all the symbols of power there. And they have no idea who he is. And uh, he understands them when they're conversing back and forth in Hebrew. Because he was 17 years of age when he was sold as a slave. So he understands all that's happening. But they don't recognize him. And anyway, they bow before him and, and uh, ask for grain. And he gives them grain. And, you know, there's a whole story. I don't want to go into all that story. But they end up going back to Canaan. And they come back and... and a couple times eventually he reveals himself unto them. And so the whole family ends up moving down to Egypt. And they get the best part of the land. They get to dwell in the land of Goshen, which is a very fertile area. And there they are and they're blessed and they get very, very comfortable in Egypt. Now Egypt has always been a type of the world. It's a symbol of the world. And how many know that this world is not my home? I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid off somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. The problem with us as Christians is sometimes we get too at home in the world. And that's what happened to Israel. They got at home. Everything was, every need was met. They were, they were VIPs. And uh, as the years progressed in the decades and the centuries, Israel multiplied to about approximately probably two or three million. And they were strong. They were hardy people. And at one point, and of course, in the succession of different pharaohs had come along, and this new king, he didn't know Joseph. He didn't know what Joseph had done and uh, what Israel, how Israel had blessed Egypt by giving them this great leader that saved them from extinction. And, and, and they were talking amongst themselves. They said, you know what? Israel is getting just far too powerful. Uh, if you know the balance of power could flip and they could become our rulers and subjugate us and make us slaves so let's make them slaves let's make them slaves and so they did and they begin to do all kinds of things to thin out the crowd of Egyptians one of the things that they did was they asked them to because they were multiplying so fast and getting so strong and they said, we want you to get rid of all the boy babies. Just throw them, toss them in the, in the river Nile to let the crocodiles have them. And, uh, of course, the Bible tells us that, um, that Moses was born around that time. And Moses' mother saw he was a beautiful child. And they wanted to destroy all the men because they figured that men were the power, the physical strength. And so if there was going to be an uprising, let's get rid of, let's deal with the army so that they won't be very powerful. Just let the females survive. And just a, a few, a few males will, will survive. But get rid of most of them. So um, uh, they hid baby, little baby Moses. And after a while, they realized it's just getting too big to hide. It's, it's difficult to hide. And a brand new infant is going to just nurse and then sleep most of the time. Right? But as they get a little bit older, they become a little bit more... Their presence becomes known. How many know, especially a little boy? A little boy, the presence gets known in the home very quickly. Boys are different animals than girls. Sure, I should say they're animals. <laughs> Anybody had a boy say amen? 
Yes, yes. They just, they get into things, right? They're curious. And uh, anyway, little Moses, he was getting to the, he's becoming a little bigger Moses. And so mother said, we got to do something. What are we going to do? And she had to trust in God because even this didn't seem like a good idea, but she made a little, a little boat. It was just a, a basket she'd woven and she pitched it inside and out to make it waterproof and put the baby in there and pushed him out. So well, essentially she was obeying the orders of the land and putting him in the Nile River but in a little boat. And of course, Miriam, his older sister, who's probably seven or eight years of age, she would go down there and watch this little boat and she just like she was playing with the sailboat. And one day, Pharaoh's daughter, isn't it amazing how God can arrange things, happened to be bathing in the Nile River and she discovered this little boat. She said, well, that is curious. That's an interesting thing. And she called her maid and she said, fetch me that little boat. And when they brought it over, they opened it up. There was a little baby. And the baby was crying. And you know, being a female, you know, that motherly maternal instinct, she felt for that little child. She knew the law of the land. And she thought, I'll save this one. I'll save him. And so she called him. She said, I'm adopted. And uh, the Bible says she named him Moses, which meant drawn out, because he was drawn out of the water. And so God spared the life of Moses. And he didn't just spare him for himself, but like Joseph, he was spared because God wanted to raise him up to spare other people. Amen. You know, when you're saved, you're saved to save others. Amen. I'm not just saved to go to heaven myself. I'm saved. For one thing, I've got four children. I plan to take every one of them to heaven, not hell. Right. Yeah. I gotta be, I gotta be on my way to heaven. And I can't force them, but I tell you what, I can really get on my knees and pray yeah. that God will move upon them and give them the same desire that I have to serve the Lord. So God raised up Moses. God saved Moses, and he was to be the deliverer. Oh, the providence and the wisdom of God. And how the devil falls right into the hands of God. Amen. Yes. How he plays right in. He was, amen. I mean, she was part of the enemy. And here they take a little, little baby Moses and they, they train him in all of the um, ways of the, Egypt. And no doubt he's, he's in line to the throne and he could be maybe Pharaoh someday. But he forsakes all that and he gets a little older and he decides to go out and check on his, his biological brothers and sisters, his family, his nation. And he goes out there and he sees, he sees this Egyptian taskmaster and he's beating and whipping a poor Israel slave. He's beating him mercilessly. And something within Moses' heart rises up and he says, this is wrong. And he takes things into his own hands and he, and he looks this way and he looks that way and he's a strong brute of a man. And he puts a fist on the side of that taskmaster and knocks him down. And uh, the guy, the guy is, he, he kills him. He kills him right there. And the Bible says he hides him in the sand. And he expected that the Israelite slaves and the others that heard the story would realize, you know, this, this is a good man. He's fighting for us. He's in defense of us. But word got back to Pharaoh of what Moses had done. And Moses ended up fleeing from Egypt. And he is a shepherd in the wilderness, in the deserts, for many, many years. Forty years later, God calls Moses back to the land of Egypt. And at this time, Moses, uh, listen, Moses was somebody. Moses was full of himself. You can't grow up as Pharaoh's grandson and not be full of yourself. Now, come on. That's royalty. Everybody waited on him. He was, he was everything that he wanted. It was just the, he just had to look or snap his finger. And it was done. And the Bible says he was educated in all the science of, uh, of Egypt. It's interesting. He doesn't use any of the uh, Egyptian ideas when he writes Genesis and tells us in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. It's interesting. You see how the Egyptians believe. I believe they, it seems to be they believe that the earth hatched out of a giant egg. That's a crazy idea. <laughs> but you don't see any of that foolishness when he writes Genesis. It's so believable. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and God said, let there be light. And 
to do us like that. Hey, God is all powerful and almighty. He just has to speak it into existence. Amen. And I believe that's exactly the way it happened. So Moses, there he is. And, but um, he's, he's full of himself, but he's, he flees from Egypt. And now he's wandering on the backside of the desert. He's nobody going nowhere. And he thinks about all that he gave up, all that he lost. And one day as he's out there tending the sheep, he happens to notice there's a bush on fire. The bush is on fire, but the strange thing is it just keeps burning and burning and burning and burning. He says, this is, this is neat. First of all, how did, it get, how did it catch on fire in the desert? It's not a cloud. There's no thunder, no lightning. So he said, I'm going to go investigate this thing. You know, it's surprising to me sometimes that people don't have a natural curiosity for spiritual things. I, I think spiritual things are the most interesting Thing and the hunger to desire to know God and to understand the ways of God, the supernatural world, the miraculous. It's, it's in our heart to want to do that. Amen. Amen. And so Moses, the Bible says, when Moses, when God saw that Moses looked behind the bush uh, and they begin to explore that, God called out to him from the bush. He said, Moses, Moses. And of course, when you think you're all by yourself and you're deep in your own thoughts and all of a sudden you hear a sound or oh, you hear a voice, you do what Moses did. I'm sure he jumped. <laughs> How many know that Moses jumped? He jumped. <laughs> he just about jumped out of the sandals. And God said, Moses, the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Take off your sandals. I think he was already out of them by this time. I think he had jumped out of the sandals. And so God speaks to me. He says, Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. What? I've been, I've been gone for 40 years. Why would why would you send me back? And God says, I'm going to send you back. You're going to have a word for Pharaoh. You're going to tell him to let my people go. Oh, God. And at this point in Moses' life, in his journey, he's got zero self-confidence. I mean, he's wandered around. His clothing is tattered. He's been just a poor shepherd in the wilderness. And God is telling him, I've got a great work for you to do, Moses. You're going to speak and Pharaoh's going to listen and you're going to bring my people out. There were probably three million of them at this point in time in Egypt. And Moses said, I can't, I can't do that, God. Who am I? And God says, Moses, I am with you. It's not who you are. It's who I am. What a powerful lesson, eh? He said, Lord, I, okay, you could go with me, but I can't talk right I, I, I've never been able to really talk well, and I stutter and I stammer. I can't go, and God says, I'll be with your mouth. I'll teach your mouth what to say. I'll give you the words. It'll be powerful. And Moses says, Lord, I really can. And he says, well, send Aaron, your brother. I'll, I'll send you back to Egypt, and Aaron will go. He can speak well. So he'll do the talking. And you'll be like God. You will represent God. And Aaron will represent you. And so they come before Pharaoh several times and say, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, who's the Lord? Why do I need to listen to God? They had their own God, the sun God. Anybody know his name, the, the sun God? Ra. Or R-A-E. I think it's pronounced Ra, but it looks like Ray. <laughs> and so... He goes before him and he says, I'm not going to listen to you. And he drives them out from his presence. And there go Moses and Aaron out from the court. And they think, Lord, you really, he didn't listen. You told us to go. You told us this would work. How many know that sometimes spiritual things don't always just work when we want them to work? They work when they're supposed to work. But sometimes we feel like, well, God, if you're listening to my prayers, why is it that, you know, this one isn't being answered? You need to trust in God and his wisdom. He's got a time, right? And he's doing things behind the scenes in people's lives that we don't always see. We need to trust God, amen, with his timing. And so, anyway, God began to send plague after plague after plague upon Egypt. And each plague, when it would come, Pharaoh would realize, I I've got to turn around and I, I better repent. And he calls Moses back and says, all right, I'll let him go. And then as soon as Moses begins to pray and the plague disappears, Pharaoh changes his mind. Aren't we fickle like that sometimes? We just, like, when God, when we need God, 
be there, Lord, and help us to straighten this out. And then when things work out, we forget all about them or forget about our promises. We're like Pharaoh, aren't we? And so each time God sent another plague until finally the plagues were so intense and they were so great. And God protected his people. God protected his people while these plagues were being poured out. And I believe this is somewhat of a picture of our day today. We're living in a day of plagues. Some of them are man-made. But we are living where just, just one virus moves around the world and can shut down the economy and can shut down traffic. The planes stop flying for the most part. I'm telling you, one little invisible virus. That's all that had to happen to bring this world to a screeching halt. That's what it was like in Egypt. And plague after plague, and how many know that it's not finished, it's not over? How many know that some of the worst that the world has ever seen is about to happen? According to the book of Revelation, there will be plagues that will be poured out. God is trying to get the world to wake up. And God is getting his people ready for the great exit. We're not going to stay in this world much longer. In fact, I don't want to be in this world much longer if it continues down the path it's going right now. It's very scary. But I have a great confidence in God that the best is yet to come for the people of God. Amen? So plague after plague happens until finally they come to the last plague. And the last plague that comes is the death of the firstborn. So the firstborn in every house in Egypt was slain that night and God told his people, he said, you need to protect yourself against this plague. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to offer a sacrifice. It's going to be a lamb. It's got to be a lamb per household. And uh, you're going to take a lamb without blemish. It was a symbol of Jesus Christ. A symbol of the cross. He said, you take that lamb and you will kill that lamb and you'll shed its blood. And you'll take that blood and you will apply it to the doorpost and the lintels. Now here is a door. The lintels and the doorpost. There were three strikes where that blood was applied. And he said, in the night, the angel of death will pass over the land of Egypt. And if you are inside your home and the blood has been offered and you are feeding upon the lamb, the lamb that was sacrificed. He said, when that death angel passes over Egypt, your family will be spared. But it took some preparation. It took some preparation. It took some careful evaluation. Let's make sure that this lamb does not have any Weakness. It's not bow-legged. It's not, uh, there's not a broken leg. There's not um, any kind of, a, it's not the ugly one from the flock. They picked the best lamb out of their flock. And they prepared that lamb and they made sure they got everybody in the house because it was important to be in the house. How many know it's important to be in the house of God? I'm glad you're here today. Amen. And not just once in a while, but every Sunday when the doors are open and our health allows us, we need to be in the house of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? It was important in that symbolism today that we are to be in fellowship with one another, with the family of God. We are to be together and we are to be feeding upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And the blood is to be applied. Now, say, why was the blood so important? Why did that little innocent lamb have to be sacrificed? Well, because Israel were sinners just like the Egyptians. And every single one of you, myself included, are sinners by nature. We were born in sin and we're sinners by choice. We have made decisions that were contrary to God's laws and God's word. And so because of that, we deserve the judgment. We deserve the punishment for our sins. But God has provided a means whereby we can escape judgment. And it is through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that we can avoid the punishment for our sins. And there is a place in the Lord in the church where we are safe from the plague. And if ever there was a time when we need to be close together with the Lord and with one another, it's today. So they applied that blood. They applied that blood. And when the death angel passed over Egypt, there was a cry that came up from every home in Egypt, from Pharaoh's house to the lowliest man in Egypt, because each family lost their firstborn son. 
But in the households of Israel, there was safety. There was safety because they made the preparation. Now, as I was studying and reading through the book of Numbers this past few weeks, I marveled at the reference to the word sacrifice in the scripture. How often sacrifice is made in scriptures. It is an oft repeated phrase. Sacrifice. See, sacrifice is a very, very powerful thing. And I'm going to be preaching and teaching in the next little while, not necessarily consecutively, but from time to time on the power of sacrifice. See, you made some effort this morning to come to the house of the Lord. And for some, it may have been a real sacrifice. Uh, but for all of us, we did make a certain amount of sacrifice to be here because there's, there's effort involved. You could have just slept in, but you came out to the house of the Lord. I want to tell you there's power in sacrifice. There is power in sacrifice. And I began to meditate upon that, and I thought, when we say we love God, how can we demonstrate that love except through sacrifice? If I say I love you, then that love is measured by the sacrifice I make for you. Amen? It's like love is spelled. The Lord spoke to me as I was meditating upon this and said that the word sacrifice is spelled love. L -O -V, or love is spelled sacrifice, rather. Sacrifice. And I thought about my own dear mother, who, with hours and hours of labor, laid upon a hospital bed, pushed me into this world. What a sacrifice. I will never, thank God, understand what that was like. Except that I was with my wife four times and almost passed out, but <laughs> I looked terrible afterwards. She looked great. But the tremendous sacrifice to bring a baby into this world. Love is spelt by sacrifice. And so the measure of my love for you is really sacrifice. And throughout scripture, sacrifice has been a way to have power with God. It acknowledges, first of all, that we're sinners, that we need salvation, to, to look to the sacrifice. God could have chosen any number of ways to come into this world to pay for our sin, but he chose to come into this world as a baby, grow up to be a man, and to lay down his life and to be nailed on an old rugged cross. I, I cannot imagine. I try to, in my mind, conceive what it would be like to be hung up on a cross and left to die. The mockery of that. And to think that God, in all his power, could have devised some other way. It could have prevented that from happening. But yet he did that to demonstrate to you and I how much he loved us. Well, the most awful death to die. You see, I couldn't be saved except for the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. The innocent lamb of God. Can we stand together? Today, I want us just to take and meditate upon the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, first of all. Because he loved us. It's real. It was an old rugged cross 2,000 years ago that he hung on. But there's a song that says, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for you and I. Yeah, and there's a cross for me. Let's pray. Our God, we're thankful that we're in this place together, that your presence is with us, you have been with us. And the wonderful love that we felt as we were worshiping is here because you made the ultimate sacrifice, Lord, that we can be restored to fellowship with you and be saved. And we're thankful today, Lord, to be in your house with your people. 
And I pray, God, that each heart will be inclined towards you, that we'll be drawn closer to you, that you administer. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would encourage and strengthen and help us to realize how much you value us, that you went to that full extent, Lord, to demonstrate your life, your love for us through your life. Bless us and help us, Lord, today to make you number one in our lives like you did when you made us number one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Everybody say in Jesus' name. In Jesus Amen. Name. God bless you today. If you'd like to give in the offering, there is a box at the back. We welcome you to do so. God bless you.